So today we want to talk about three things. Um, do we hear God or is God speaking unbelief and how God speaks? So I just want to start off by saying, uh, and I know that I've said this in weeks before, and I know that it's kind of hard, up, hard to keep up with what we're talking about because we go, you haven't seen me in like three weeks, four weeks, and then we're flip-flopping classes. So I'm hoping that you guys are able to keep up. All right. So uh, I just want to remind you that Father God, our Heavenly Father, the creator of all things and the giver of all good gifts to his children, that we should bear in his likeness and in his image, which means that we should be creative. I keep uh, reiterating this because uh, still I fall into the trap sometimes where I don't think that maybe um, I have the ability to be able to be creative in certain areas. Um, so uh, if you think about it, unbelievers lead the way in inventions, artistic expression. I actually think who created the iPhone or who created the computer, which it was, what was his name? Bill, Bill Gates. There you go. <laughs> Bill Gates, who is definitely not a believer, you know? Uh, and I think about like other inventions, like I wonder who created the Nintendo. Or I wonder who created um, that vacuum cleaner that vacuums up stuff off the floor so you don't have to work. Or you know what I mean? There's just like, there's so many things that like from the time that I was a child until now, there are like so many inventions that um, really are just like handy assets in my life now, like my phone. My GPS, do you remember a time when you had to get a map and follow a map to get directions to get where you were going? I don't even know if I remember that in my life because I wasn't a driver. No, I do. I remember put, printing out Google directions. MapQuest. Actually, when I was in Teen Challenge in our fundraising folders, we had MapQuest to get to our hotel, and then we had MapQuest to get to our fundraiser. I don't even remember how we got directions if we got kicked out of a store. I want to think we went to the library. <laughs> I don't know. I don't remember. Or maybe somebody called us on the phone and gave us the directions. <laughs> And that was 10 years ago, y'all. And I know that they had GPS because they had MapQuest, but like on your mobile device, I don't think that we were quite there yet. So I, as I was, you know, preparing this teaching, I was thinking about things like that. Like, are these believers? Were these people that were picking up on uh, things of God that God was trying to open up these new inventions? But I do think about Chick-fil-A guy. I do think about how, like, if you go to Chick-fil-A, that is the fastest drive through in America, hands down. I don't care if you're in California. I don't know if they have those there. But in any part of the United States, I believe that if you go into a Chick-fil-A, it is the longest line, but it is the quickest drive through So I praise God for that man, <laughs> for tapping into uh, God's heart on that. But anyways. Um, it is, it is literally the church's identity. It is their uh, duty to embrace uh, this sense of responsibility, I believe, because with that uh, place of in imagination or uh, being in God's, like God the creator who was who created all things, who created us to be in his image to create all things. But somewhere the church has this opinion that, uh, or has this mindset, this mentality that it's not our responsibility. It's like almost like the church and us as believers, we cower down from the things of the world because uh, the word says that we're not of this world, but it also says that uh, not to be entangled into uh, 
not to be entangled into the cares of this life. But I think that we misconstrue that, that we, you know, we're not to be involved in those things, that we're kind of, um, I don't know, just, we don't have an influence. But Jesus says, uh, I came to set the world on fire. I'm not of this world. So just as he came to do that, us as believers, it's an, a, a duty. And I'm not talking about like setting up chaos, but we were, we were created to be the influence. So the renewed mind understands that the king's dominion must be realized at all levels of society. Now, God created all of mankind to be, to have what? Dominion. We were created to have dominion, either one way or the other. Oh, thank you, love. And it says, and I believe that in all levels of society that we are to take that place with the king's dominion. Someone with a kingdom mindset will look at an overwhelming need in the world and say, God has the solution for this problem and I have access. Therefore, I will seek him for the answer. And this is where us as, I mean, new believers, old believers, uh, I think that m more of us coming uh, straight out of probably the program or uh, just beginning to walk with God, um, we might sit down and say, well, I'm not in a position to be used by God at that level yet. Do you got, can you guys relate to that? We see people like Apostle, or we see people like, um, gosh, what is that guy's name? Uh, Randy Clark. But this dude does this prayer thing. Uh, Dutch Sheets. And we see, uh, I see, I can go to a conference and, and, and be around people. And they're, honestly, if I look at it, are doing the same things that we do here but maybe in a different area of influence, maybe not solely on people that are coming out of drug addicted mindsets, but they're doing that with people that are coming out of religious mindsets or um, they're geared towards uh, education or they're geared towards government or they're geared towards, you, you know, uh, releasing angelic hosts. And then that's their specific mission in life, intercession. But uh, I can think to myself, gosh, I... God can't be used like that by God. And so uh, I think that um, this is where us as a people, like we have a, a choice during these early movements in our life where God is really speaking. We have, I remember when I first came into the program, I had such enthusiasm to serve God. I had such enthusiasm to tell someone about God. I can remember being on my pass in the program and this little cashier was checking me out at Walgreens. And I had such enthusiasm to tell her what God had done in my life. I, I would, anybody that I would radically, or I would come in contact, I would have this, just be radical about telling them about Jesus. And I can remember my poor mama would take me places. She'd be like, tell them. <laughs> tell them about God. Tell them. Tell them. Or she would take me in front of people. She's like, pray for him. Pray for him. She does that to me now. We were at a funeral and she's like, here, pray for this person. I'm like, it was at my grandma's funeral. And I'm like, okay. You know, uh, I still have that enthusiasm. But I remember as a young woman coming out of such a bondage, man, on my fundraisers, I just wanted to find the next person that would hear me, that would listen to me, that there was a living God and he wanted to help them or he wanted to help their child or he wanted to, uh, he had a plan for their life and living in, the, uh, in a uh, dead and just mundane place, that wasn't God, you know? And um, so the longer that I started to walk with God and I would get in this routine and this rhythm, I would, uh, 
I would I would start to back down. I just, I don't really want to tell anybody about Jesus today. I want to get my chewing gum or my baby formula, and I want to get back in my car, and I want to get up the road. Uh, I can remember, I have this uh, cousin who's like, uh, he's the board of directors in the city that I'm from. And um, we were talking about addiction. He was like, oh yeah, you know, I just know, and I'm, this is last year. This is again at my grandmother's funeral. God will use you wherever you are, wherever you are, if you are yielded to him. If you're tuned out, then I mean, you're probably not gonna pick up on how he's speaking. Now I know that um, when I first came out of the gate, having a conversation with this man, whether he'd be my cousin or not, because when I say it was my cousin, it wasn't like we had this really like strong relationship. I mean, he was a professional businessman, okay? And I probably wouldn't have engaged with him at this time, three months out of the program, trying to get him to believe something that was real. But anyways, um, he said, yeah, I know that you are going to, that you just struggle with addiction. I know how hard it is on you. I'm 10 years sober. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm, I don't struggle with addiction. He's like, I know that's why you don't come home. I'm like, no, that's, um, yeah, now, you know, a year out of the program, that was definitely the reason I wasn't coming home because I wasn't sure, you know, if I was going to be able to be plugged in somewhere or there was going to be other people that were like-minded like me, that I would be able to grow in God's word and his truth and who I was as a daughter. But, you know, addiction really isn't an issue in my life i i pull people out of those fires because i have an overcoming anointing in my life because god set me free and that is why that i still do it but he was dead set to believe that you know i and even though listen to me i'm ministering this to the man he still is like yeah i know always an addict <laughs> once an addict always an addict i'm like no no, no, no. But you know what? By the time I left that conversation, he still didn't believe me. <laughs> but there was a seed planted. I wasn't going to stand in agreement with it. You see, some people, because they don't want to have controversy, and that's really the thing, is we don't want to have, we don't want to stir a boat. We don't want to have controversy. And I'm not saying uh, have an argument with somebody by any means. But the, the thing is, is that we just want to, if somebody comes against what we believe or what we're saying, we just, we don't want to stir the pot. But what if your truth and your living testimony is the thing that they come in contact to seek out deeper truth of who he is? You see, that's your influence. And when we talk about imaginations and, and uh, being creative, um, it really stems back to the testimony of, of who he is in your life and being yielded in that place to be able to minister the truth of who a living God is. I believe that's where we all begin. We get, as believers, we get sidetracked um, of the mission that God has given us. And that is to be able to tell the truth about who he is. John 17 says, we are not of the world. And 2 Timothy 2 says, don't get entangled in the affairs of the world. It, what this is talking about is don't be joined into worldly influences, worldly desires, worldly lust. Don't attach yourself into those things, but you are the light of the world. The light influences what? The darkness. The, the only way that darkness influences light or the only way that darkness can influence, I believe, a believer is the absent of the light. That's the only way darkness can influence, because there is an absence of light. 
And I think back to some, and this is just, um, I think back to denominations when it says that the world will hate us because of him who is in us. And I, I think back to uh, because the world hates us, not all believers. I know that us uh, that are coming out of these lifestyles that are part of this ministry, you know, people hating us, it's not really. They hated us before. <laughs> they hated us in our mess. So it's not really something that um, really shakes us or causes us to be... Um, cry in a corner for say, you know, it's not, it doesn't, it's not something that causes us to back down, but you know, for most of the church, uh, because the world hates us and doesn't agree with us and doesn't live by our standards, we sometimes cause our, or we'll cower in a corner. We'll hide ourselves. We're just waiting on the return of Jesus and we're just gonna hunker down in a cave and we're just gonna get through it until we see him coming through the clouds. I know people like that. I know people like that. And that's not how God created us to function. Our imagination is like a canvas for the Father. If clean, the artist has much to work with. God is looking for people that are yielded to be able to allow him to paint on their canvas. Here's the problem. And this is where I think, uh, where I, have fallen in and uh, recently have seen uh, other people and I think it's something that um, us who for the most part know that we're called by God would you all agree for the most part, everybody around us, we know that God called us and he has an intended purpose for our life. Right, Dave Hurst? You awake? Okay. I worry about you sometimes. We believe that God has a calling in our life. But we get so preoccupied with not being worthy and uh, we get stuck in those mindsets uh, that God won't use me like that. And so what happens is that we waller in our self-centeredness. And so what God is trying to do, maybe through you to a group of people or to, with, through you as at a beginning, through you to that one that just came in the ministry or uh, through you, uh, maybe he's speaking a word for you to release through um, during prayer or that's for an intended group of people. What happens is we get so self-focused on I'm not worthy or I can't do this or I'm scared or blah, 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 blah. What if it's not the right word? Me, 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 me. And so we're so focused on us that we can't even carry the revelation that God's trying to give us. And I think that us as ministers and us as, and when I say us as ministers, I'm talking to a body of people. I'm talking to people who are listening by live stream, ministers, that because we're so focused on, I can't do this, that we're not carrying the mission that God is calling us to do. And it's all about us. Like preaching the gospel can't do it. Not called to it. Nope. Well, as believers, we're all called to be ministers of the gospel. And yes, I understand not everybody's going to have a microphone and behind a pulpit, but can I tell you that not being behind a pulpit would in my mind be the most powerful ministry that you could walk in because the eyes of man are not on you. The eyes of the Lord, if you're ministering 
here and there, to and fro, and the eyes of the Lord is upon you, think about the power that you have that you're not worried about the eyes of man. To flow in a place where man's not even paying attention. The only person that's hearing you is the person that you're ministering the gospel to. We focus on our insecurities. Yeah, focusing on our inward, our, our insecurities is causing us to look inward and not be able to carry the revelation of Christ. At some point, and I say this like I'm ministering to people who are uh, just starting to walk in, in his fullness, it has to stop being about us. But, you know, I myself have fallen into a trap like this. I may not voice it out or I may voice it out. I may be going, myself, I can't do this and keep walking and then get up and do it anyways. But at some point, it has to not be about us, but be about his work. All right. Jesus is always talking. He is the word of God. And if Jesus is the word of God, I would say that he is always speaking. Now, I do know in my own life, there are times when uh, I may not hear him, and that may be... Um, there could be a, a, a several reasons why I'm not hearing him. Uh, doubt and unbelief being one, and the major one. Uh, disobedience. Uh, sometimes I, I can remember in the program, I, there was a time and a period in my life that, that I did not hear him. And I would search and seek, am I in sin? Am I doing this? Oh, he's not speaking to me because I'm doing this and blah, 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 blah. Has anybody been there? Could we maybe think that we're not listening, or not that we're not listening, but we don't know how he's speaking? Because there are many ways that God can speak to us. You know, ultimately, by his word, the scriptures, by his audible voice, by a still small voice, dreams, visions. I'm going to go through these, but I'm going to read these. Um, I'm going to, Bill Johnson goes through these, like, languages of the spirit. Um, but is it because that maybe we're not in tune or in a place where we can respond to what he's saying? Yeah. So like I, he is literally, I would say talking all the time, but he shifts. It's, it's like that relationship. I refer to this all the time because I got the greatest revelation about how God, who God was in my life and his perfect will for my life, but I'm not a puppet on a string. Like I have a choice and he allows me those choices and he allows me the ability to do things, right? He's not going to control me because the reason, the number one reason I would say that I didn't want to follow God is because I didn't want to be controlled. And ultimately, yeah, I want to do what I wanted to do. But I think I, I had a mindset that if I'm following God, then, um, then I don't have a say-so anymore, right? You don't have a say-so. Your life is over. You're dead. No more fun. <laughs> no more parties. No more wild things. But really, it's God giving us choice. Are you going to be yielded to my spirit? Are you going to walk in my fullness? Are you going to search out the mysteries of God? Are you
you going to search out the mysteries of God? Because listen, there are so many things that we think that God is withholding from us, but he's saying here, seek after it. It's there. And that to me is greater than any kind of wild party that I'm going to get up in the morning and be like, oh God, why did I do that? Always. Why did I do that? Anyways, so God is always talking. All right, let me find here. Paul says in first Corinthians, I'm going to say this before, uh, we go into this in first Corinthians 11 and one, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Be, Paul saying, Hey, follow me as I am imitating Christ. You see the position he gave himself was an unlimited access to the mysteries of God and it enabled him to touch a lost and dying world because of his, he was imitating Christ. And so he calls us to do the same thing. See, we're called to be like Christ. And, and we say that a, a lot, but exactly what does that mean? He, he flowed in power. He flowed in the supernatural. He uh, withdrew himself to be with God continually over. He ministered to people daily. Everyone that I would say that he came into contact with, he was an overflowing ministry. He was an influence. He was not influenced. He was an influencer. Same with Paul. But we say, oh, Paul was an apostle. He was also a murderer. He was also uh, bound in religion for, uh, he was brought up in that way. In that way. I, I think if I can remember, Paul was, was brought up like with the, uh, the high of the hide of the Pharisees. Like that means he was brought up in the Torah day and night, night and day and rules and regulations. And in those that were following Christ in the spirit of freedom, he came in, he was like, that's enough. We will not and started murdering them. And then not only mur him himself murdering, but influencing those around him like he did with Stephen. I don't think he cast the first stone, but by the words of his lips, he was influencing those around him and they were, they started casting the stones. So listen, uh, this man was a religious, he was a murderer and just like us, brought up in religion, brought up in murderous idolatry, brought up in, uh, in arrogance in uh, living a life for us and us alone. And God used him in such a mighty way, just as he's calling us. Nikki, will you look and see if that baby's awake? Sorry. All right. Let's go to John 12. Start in verse 28. Now I'm going to show you this. Uh, John 12, verse 28. Verse 28. Father, bring glory to your name. Sorry, I got sidetracked with the text message. Father, bring glory to your name. And then a voice spoke from heaven saying, I have already brought glory to my name and I will do so again. Then the crowd heard the voice. Some thought it was thunder while others declared an angel had spoken to him. Then Jesus told him the voice was for your benefit, not mine. All right. The audible voice of God the Father came from heaven while Jesus was speaking to a crowd. The people acknowledged hearing something, but they did not know what it was. 
not only did they realize that the voice of God, that that was, didn't realize that it was the voice of God, but they also didn't realize that there was a meaning for it for their life. How many times do we, when God is speaking and we don't even acknowledge that it's him speaking or that it's for us? I know that there's been so many times that um, someone has given up a word, come and given a word uh, pertaining to, uh, let's just say the body or the congregation, we'll just use a church setting. And I, and I'll be like, well, that was a good word. And it was God literally speaking directly to my heart concerning something that he had been trying to deal with me about. And then, you know, two weeks later, two days later, I'll be sitting in prayer and be like, that was you. Or he'll send somebody to me and I'm like, oh, it ha it's not, it doesn't happen so much now, but like when I was in my program, somebody would come up and just give you a really encouraging word. And I'm like, yep. And as soon as they leave, I'll hear the voice of the Lord say, that was for you. But if, if I had not heard his still small voice, remember I was in that enthusiasm. I was, I just wanted to hear the next best thing. I just wanted to hear him say something else. I just, I wanted all that he had. I was so on fire when I, uh, dude, I was so on fire in my program. Now I was a little resistant because of my attitude and, uh, the strong personality that I had, you know, some call it leadership, others say call it disobedience, but, um, <laughs> I definitely got in a lot of trouble for that. But anyways, um, I was still in the midst of that rough and I don't know how to uh, steward my own personality. I was so on fire for Jesus, okay? <laughs> so, you know, God, he has such grace on your life, praise God. But anyways, uh, how many times do we fall in this trap though, guys? You know, when God is speaking, but we're not hearing, And what it boils down to, really, I can, I, I, I'm going to just expose myself. I fall into this trap where I hear God speaking to me into a, in a service and I hear God saying something, but I disregard it like it's my own. I disregard it, you know, as that's just me. And then really it's my unbelief that keeps me from being, from speaking out God's truth. And Jesus, you know, in, uh, he, he, um, he addresses that unbelief. And that's really what I want to talk about is our unbelief because, uh, God spoke to provide those people a way out of their unbelief. Every bystander in that place, he spoke audibly from heaven into a crowd of people where Jesus is performing signs, wonders, and miracles. He's providing the way out. And they still, because their heart was hard, could not, it, it blocked their perception of, of what he said and who he said it to what he was saying to them. Some said it was thunder and others said it was angels, still not regarding that it was something for them. And Jesus says, hey, he didn't come to say that to me, y'all. He came for you. You see, us uh, as, as believers, as people growing in Christ, and I understand there's a grace for it, but I, on my way here, was repenting for unbelief. You see, unbelief is sin in our life. And uh, those sins keep us from flowing in that place of yieldedness with God. In that place of, hey, here's my blank canvas, right? I think we get to that place. Here's my blank ca canvas. Here's a clean slate. God, paint your picture 
what do you want to do? But then when he starts painting, we fall into that unbelief. Oh, that wasn't God. He wouldn't do that. See, he, he wouldn't do something that radical. We fall into that trap of just, just be conservative. Just, you just, you just, you play it safe. You be conservative and don't be like those extremists because, uh, now I'm not telling everybody to go wild and buck crazy. Last time I did that and I felt God, <laughs> the last time I did that and I felt God call me out of a box into freedom, I had a little bit of trouble. <laughs> you know, a, a whole bunch of freedom broke out, but um, <laughs> I, when I'm saying he's calling us to live an extreme life, Listen, I, I'm talking about a yielded life. I'm talking about a life prompted by his spirit, a life that is um, discerning his voice and how he's speaking to us in, in every situation in our life, not just in a church service. So, you know, uh, on our fundraisers, I think that is your training ground. I believe wholeheartedly that is your training ground to be able to flow into a church service or to flow in the giftings of God out there when ain't nobody paying no attention to us. Your leader is not there. You have people that are following you. And so missing the mark when man is not judging or man is not watching Man, that's the best place to be. To at pray, I just encourage you all, when you go out fundraising this weekend, we're breaking the weather, so there is no winter storm warning this weekend, glory to God, I don't think. Anybody check the weather? I usually be checking that sucker on Monday morning. <laughs> what are we doing? Are we shifting? Uh, ask God, Lord, Forgive me for my unbelief, but help it. Help my God, forgive me for my unbelief, but God, I'm asking you to help me. Help me to believe. Help me build faith in the hearing of your voice, whatever way that might be. You know, as I, and we'll get into that in just a minute. I was thinking about, and I know a lot of you guys do this, and uh, it is actually a way that I'm not really, uh, I don't thrive in. But after reading these uh, characteristics of the spirit language um, by numbers, I'm like, eh, I don't know, y'all. That's a little, eh, I don't know about, you know, you'll see 37, you know. I've been with people, like, oh, I saw 37 there and there and there and there. But for the most part, listen, God can be speaking to you in that place. Now, don't get out there and, and I, don't get out there and not flow in the Holy Spirit. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, don't take it to another place where you're searching out a number 37. But if the Spirit keeps bringing 37, 37 in front of you, then we stop and say, God, what are you speaking to me? Now, there, you can get these books, and I'm, before we go into this next section, you can get books that give you interpretation of dreams and interpretation of numbers. Yes, these things are good, but listen, you have to seek God as to what he is telling you. Now, these books are good. They give you understanding of what may be going on. But if you have a dream in the midnight hour, do not wake up, open your dream book and look for the symbolism. Now, pray, ask God, if you're, you, what are you trying to tell me? If you hear nothing, keep seeking, keep seeking. It may not come right then and right there, but it will come. You stay in tune. You keep asking him and seeking him for the discernment or for the understanding. He's not going to give you one thing without, not, without giving you the other. Okay? Same with the numbers. And I, like I said, I believe that unbelief is an outward appearance of a... Uh, an outward appearance of living a conservative life. Meaning, 
I'm just gonna take it easy. I'm just gonna read my little Bible and I'm going to come to church and I'm gonna love the Lord, but there's so much more. We can love God or we do love God. Most of us, we have this burning passion for him for what he did for us in our life, right? That would probably carry us for all of our days, right? Um, and it just, ah, oh, I can't believe you did this because I thought I was gonna die this way. But there is so much more in this love language, in this relationship, in this building of who he is in us. You see that conservative life will cause us not to be an extremist. And I know that a lot of us are uh, we're like, oh, gosh, don't talk about that. We'll have crazy people running around the place and we'll be looking at them like, oh, what are they doing? Hey, they could be crazy and they could be way off. But what if they are picking up on the spirit of the living God? And we try to silence that. That religion will do that. That religion will do that, Dave Hurst. Okay. I have literally like five minutes. Okay. So I did not get time to go through this and uh, take notes for all these things. And the reason that I'm using this is because he has examples of these, um, of the spirit. I'm going to, I'm going to name them off, but he has like really good examples of like how that they've been effective in his life. And as I was reflecting over them, I don't know that I've actually encountered God in all these ways, but I'm like, huh. Or maybe that I have, I have encountered him, but I haven't really, I never really until now, like, was able to acknowledge that was really your spirit speaking to me. Okay. The first, okay, let me go over them real quick. Let me get a little drink. Okay. The language of scriptures. The language of the audible voice, the language of the still small voice, the language of visions, the language of dreams. We also have, we have daydream. He goes into two different daydream and nightdream. The language of dark saying, which is parables and riddles. Unusual coincidences. Unusual circumstances. Now, this is all under the, the, um, I'm not really sure why he calls it dark sayings. Unusual coincidences. Let me, unusual circumstances and prophecy, testimonies. That is, that is under all of one, one category. And then senses. Okay. All right. So let's start with uh, the language of scriptures. The scriptures are the basis for all hearing from God. While God will not violate his word, he often violates our understanding of his word. Remember, God is bigger than his book. The Bible the Bible does not contain God. It reveals him. The truth can be represented into two Greek words, logos and rhema. All right. The logos is often used to speak the written word. Our holy Bible reading is the most common way to receive instruction and learning to recognize his voice. Page after page is filled with practical instructions for life. Learning the principles of God's word will help us to learn to recognize his voice by establishing truth in our hearts. The psalmist affirmed us, affirmed the purpose saying, your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you, Lord. There is where we find kingdom principles for our life. They work for anyone who applies them. And then you have the rhema word. It is a freshly spoken word. 
some of us, if you've ever had inner healing, God comes into our life in that place. Listen, in that place of hurt, in that place um, of brokenness in our life, when we go in, we look into the deeper root issues. There always has to be a rhema word released, a freshly spoken word specifically for you in that place. It brings healing or it has in my life. And I've seen it in many lives, many lives of people where that, that freshly spoken word comes in and it just, it like, it heals the soul. It always carries an expression that which is being uttered. Therefore, it carries an aspect of immediate within, intimate immediacy within oftentimes God brings upon his word and gives life to something written for now the spoken word is never to replace the written word the more of the written word we have in our hearts the greater the capacity we have to hear the spoken word because he speaks to which has been deposited in our heart and calls it forth. See, that rhema word will speak to what's been deposited in your heart. That's why it's so important, guys, that we have the word, the word, the word, that we're not reading the word to give a word, but we're reading the word that it's deposited in us and it becomes a part of us. It's very, um, it is a, uh, the number one way that we hear God. It's through his scriptures. You read, you open the word. That's the first time that I ever heard God. I opened his word and I had such conviction about the way that I was living my life. And he was giving me instructions by the spirit, instructions on how to live my life. That was God's ministering to me. Yes, it was his word, but he was speaking directly to places in my life. You ever open the word and it's like this? <laughs> right into your gut that is god speaking and ministering to us about us right but that rhema word comes in and it's a now word not that it's not his word but it's a now word uh, speaking to you on the places that's already been deposited by his word does that make sense okay the language of the audible voice of god now there's been a couple times in my life where i've heard earth shaking God speak to me in my life. And it says the voice of God is not an impression that we have to find language for. It is a direct word for word communication from God to us. The audible voice may come to the natural ear while you're awake or while you're asleep. It can also come to our spiritual ears. The reason I make this distinction, distinction he says, is that after it has happened. You can't always remember if it was out loud or if it was internal. It is far more than an impression. It is a clear hearing that of someone speaking. Okay. I'm going to share with you. I've probably shared this many times, but it was something I had been in the program, uh, maybe three months, two, three months. I don't know. And I was in worship and we were having a big, you know, noontime worship and uh the lord said you will follow that man now listen he was talking about apostle and i was like okay meaning his ministry that i would follow him and um i can remember like i it was so like out of nowhere and like earth shaking in my life i was like what was that the first time I'd ever heard, I mean, I'd been convicted by his word, but it was the first time I'd ever heard God like literally speak to me. And I was like, oh my gosh, okay. But see, there was a series of events that had happened during that time or uh, about three or four months after that. And uh, Pastor Winnell and Apostle, they had left Teen Challenge and I myself was court ordered there. And I was like, oh, that wasn't God. And so I, I kept, I hung on to that because I knew that there was something different because I knew that the place that I was at, that God had not called me to that place. He called me to finish, you know, he called me to complete my assignment in that place. But I knew that God had not called me into that specific place. So I was just in a place of waiting. So anyways, uh, things turned and, um, 
Anyway, so here I am at Life Changers, and it was not by my own hand, but it was by the hand of the Lord. Completely opened the door. I'm telling you, could have been nothing but him. And so, but there have been times in my life when I've been discouraged and I have been uh, wanting out of recovery ministry, wake up first. Um, I wanted to get out of recovery ministry or I wanted out of whatever situation that I was at in right now. And I always revert back to that place when God told me that. I will open the door, you follow as I instructed. So it, it's kept my life literally on course. All right. Oh my gosh, I have two minutes. Okay. Um, the language of the still small voice. This is a quiet voice or impression of the heart. This is probably the most common way to hear from God. It is sometimes through your own inner voice in that it is our own thoughts and ideas. While we do have such a voice, it is wisdom to learn to recognize his still small voice. It is quiet, so we must become quiet, not talking all the time, <laughs> to recognize its consistency. Someone gave me help, helpful clue to discerning his voice, they said. This is Bill. You know you've heard from God whenever you think you have an idea, and it's better than one you could think of on, yourself, on your own. All right, the language of visions. Now, we know this. Visions comes both to the natural eye and to the eyes of the heart. Uh, the second are the pictures in the mind, which are the visual equivalent of the still small voice. They are easy to miss as they are to get... They're easy to miss as they are easy to get. Learning, leaning into God is what makes this one of, makes this one come into focus. External, many people refer to this as an open vision. Though I've never had one, I have had a friend who had one. We're not going to be able to go into all that. So uh, vision, it can come in uh, the midnight hour. It can come in the day. You can go into a place where you have an open vision or you can have a flash, just a flash in your mind. And I, I've seen people who've, who has that uh, like flash where it's like a pelvis bone or it's a kidney. Or I think that sometimes that words of knowledge come through vision, a flash or a word. Okay, uh, language of dreams, you can have a daydream. Uh, and I actually had one of those, I was not asleep uh, last week or the week before. I was not asleep, but I went into uh, a dream that was almost like a reality. And so, uh, and the Lord was showing me some things and I was actually in spiritual warfare in that place. So it can happen when you're awake and then you have, of, of course, a night dream. And, you know, a lot of uh, times I've experienced that night dreams, they're showing you maybe insight uh, of maybe spiritually what's taking place in your life or maybe around the people, the people that are around you. I know when I was first coming out of the program, I had a lot of dreams concerning my future. I had a lot of dreams, don't get this all in another place, but about my husband, about the course in my life that I would take. I had many confirmations um, through dreams as to what God was going to do in my life, uh, where God was taking me, not full pictures, but you know, uh, things that I would be able to, um, I'm almost done. Uh, things that I would be able to hold on to now that would get me to where I am now. All right, and I don't think I'm going to be able to go through this, uh, the language of dark sayings, because it is a lot. Um, and it talks about parables, riddles, and we may, we'll try to go into that next time. Um, yeah, we'll, we're going to just stop right here, and um, we'll start, we'll pick up here and try to, uh, to go more in depth into this, uh, the language of the Spirit. So, Father... Uh, I thank you for your men and women, God. I thank you for your sons and daughters, Lord, that you are raising them up 
in uh, the ways of your kingdom, God, that you're raising them up as influencers in society, God. So I'm praying, God, that their hearts would be yielded uh, to you, God, Father, that they would be yielded um, to to the way that the spirit is moving in their life and speaking to them, God, that they would not push any coincidences aside, God, but they would uh, press in to how you're speaking, God. And I just, Lord, I just repent uh, corporately for our unbelief, God. Help us, Lord, in our unbelief, God. Build our faith in you, God.